What is traditional night vision? Traditional night vision is also referred to as starlight night vision, which is generally used by the military, or at least is developed by the military and then from there went into the civil use. It magnifies the amount of received protons from various different sources, uh, such as the starlight or moonlight. Generally speaking, they are labeled Gen 1, 2, 3, 3 plus, 4, and I think the military is up to Generation 5. The pros are that you don't need additional light sources. Uh, the, the device will work with starlight by itself. That's sufficient light for the device to function. However, uh, as soon as you're indoors where there's literally no light at all, you'll also need um, infrared illuminators. Cons are it is very expensive. It doesn't produce a digital output. It's an analog unit as such. And therefore you can't edit the footage. You can't provide additional information in that footage as you would be able to with digital night vision, which we'll get to in a minute. It is extremely difficult to identify targets, especially camouflage targets, with traditional night vision because you only see two colors or the spectrum in between. Uh, therefore, it is very difficult to see or make out animals unless they move about, then it's quite easy to pick up but it is definitely harder than you would during the day where you have the full color palette uh, to your disposal. Now we'll look at digital night vision. A digital night vision camera is digital and sends a digital signal to a display. Unlike traditional night vision, which is purely analog, a digital night vision can have things added to the display. The digital image and footage can be recorded. The pros are they are cheaper to buy and you can add additional information to that digital display. The cons are they require an infrared illuminator or torch because they are not sensitive enough like traditional night vision. Just like traditional night vision, it is hard to locate camouflage targets. What is thermal imaging? Thermal imaging is the process where a thermal camera captures and creates an image of an object by using its infrared radiation emitted by that object. In other words, you are seeing the heat that is projected from each surface or object. Pros are that there is no need for an additional infrared illuminator, quick acquisition of targets, long range identification. It is easy to identify camouflage targets. There are now very cost effective entry units available. Thermal imaging devices will produce a digital signal which can be recorded you can add audio to it as well as radicals and all sorts of other information. The cons of thermals are high-end units are very expensive, identification of targets can be very difficult for beginners, and laser rangefinders are required to judge distance. When you use a thermal imaging device, what basically happens is that you can see the heat of every object, and that's grass, trees, water, cars, whatever you can imagine, any object. Now where Thermal really, really, really brings in its benefits is that the manufacturers have programmed it in a way that when something is around the living temperature, so living object temperature, and we're talking here 34 degrees Celsius to 36 degrees Celsius, that sort of range and above, the thermal imaging device will really, really strongly indicate whatever object is at that temperature. So you basically imagine you have a black screen. If everything was super cold, it would be black, but then you have grass and that warms up a little bit. So you slightly see the grass in a, in a grayish. But as soon as you hit the 34, 35 degrees, the object is gonna be bright white. It's gonna stand out really significantly. So what you then do is just, you just scan an area really quickly and all the living objects just pop up and you can really, really easily see them and therefore uh, be able to hopefully identify uh, or at least find them very, very quickly. Okay, let's talk about what are infrared illuminators Infrared illuminators or torches are nothing else than a typical torch with an LED in it. The LED, however, doesn't emit visible light, but rather uses infrared light that is not visible to the human eye or the animal eyes. The wavelength of that infrared light 
is 850 nanometers or 940 nanometers. It is important to notice that no matter what digital night vision device you are using, all devices will be able to see 850 nanometers as well as 940 nanometers. If you buy a device and is advertised as an 850 Digex, which is a Pulsar product for example, or a 940 Digex, it's the same device. The only difference is the LED in the illuminator that comes with the device. What is the difference between the 850 and the 940? 850 is referred to as the long range by infrared light, whereas the 940 is referred to as the stealth or invisible infrared illuminator. Both are in essence invisible. The only difference is that the 850 will light up the objective lens like you can see here and you can see a little red shimmer whereas the 940 will only light up the actual LED so a tiny tiny dot within your scope. What this means is that if you're doing close range shooting sub 50 meters at night you'll be better off with the 940. If you want to do long range shooting, you're better off with the 850 because the 850 will throw more light or you will perceive it in the device as a stronger torch when you look through the device. So with that, you can get ranges up to 250 meters. There are some infrared illuminators called sniper hawk lights. These illuminators have a reach or range up to a kilometer. Realistically, you still be shooting not past 300 meters probably because the resolution within your digital night vision device will just get so pixelated that you just don't want to take the shot or you can't tell what you're shooting at. The illuminators that are provided with the devices generally speaking will not get you past 200 meters and even 200 meters in some circumstances will be relatively hard to manage. One more thing on illuminators. When you look through a digital night vision device and you have an illuminator, you shoot this infrared light out, it bounces off the object and it goes back into the device, gets registered by the device and the device produces an image on the display. If you have objects in front of you, like grass or bushes, and the target is behind that as in a little bit offset so you have a direct line of sight, but it kind of sits in front. When you use an 850 for example and you power it up all the way in order to light something up at two, three hundred meters, what happens is that the objects in the foreground get really, really bright to the point where it potentially brightens out your image and you can't see anything past that point. It's something to consider where you want to decide if you want to go into thermal vision which doesn't have that limitation or digital night vision. Does digital night vision work during the day? Digital night vision does work during the day. However, some devices have a lens cap that you have to put on with a tiny hole in the middle so that not too much light comes into the objective lens and it gets registered by the camera or the sensor therefore. Other devices have the ability to switch between daylight which then is represented with colors or with daylight colors and then you can switch them over to night vision mode and then it goes into black and white or green and white. Yes, they do work during the day. However, unless you have a device that switches to color, which the vast majority of them now do, you wouldn't want to use it during the day unless you have to because you'll be limited to two colors and the spectrum in between which gives you less information than if you were to just use your binoculars or a day scope. So you're basically worse off than just using a day scope. In summary, digital night vision devices do work during the day. Please ensure if you wanna use them during the day that you buy the device that also has the ability to show colored imagery during the day. Now, can thermal imaging be used during the day? Because thermal images are not affected by light, they're only affected by heat radiation, then in the darkness of night or the brightness of day does not affect the device. But what is affected is the temperature of your surroundings. So at nighttime everything's cool and the heat of the animals and the objects you're targeting are highlighted. 
But during the day, the sun will heat up everything around you. So down trees, tree stumps, ant hills, and rocks all heat up to a similar temperature and you get a lot of false positives. You wouldn't believe how many times we've been out there hunting hot rocks. Our rule is if it hasn't moved in 30 seconds, move on, it's a rock. What is better, digital night vision or thermal? Now let's talk about the differences in order to determine which one is better. Better doesn't always mean better for everyone. So it comes down to your specific circumstances, which, which type of device is better for you, rather than saying it's just better. Digital night vision is very good at identifying animals or objects from greater distances. These days, digital night vision chips produce around a HD output or even a 4K output, which gives you a lot of pixels and therefore a lot of detection range. Because as you zoom in on it to a digital image, the pixels half every time you double your magnification. So if I start out with an HD or a 4K image, I can magnify more often the image than if I were to start with something like a 640 or even a 380 pixel sensor from a thermal perspective. So therefore, digital night vision gives you a greater range, greater identification. In addition, it gives you a little bit more detail on the object itself. Whereas in thermal imagery, the image is generally a shape outlined and you don't get a lot of detail on the animal itself. You rather get the shape, the outside shape of the animal and have to determine what it is based on that. Digital night vision gives you the color contrast, even though into colors and the spectrum in between, but it gives you those shades and therefore you could potentially see that something is a spotted fellow deer, for example, whereas with thermal you just get the outline. Some contract shooters who have to ensure that they're shooting the right animal, as in a wallaby or a kangaroo, a male or a female, they will be using a digital night vision in order to ensure that they are shooting the right species of animal and obviously the right gender. Other than that, thermal imaging is superior, especially when using a thermal handheld device in combination. So here what happens is you use a thermal imaging handheld device, you scan an area, you find a heat source, you then bring up your scope which also uses thermal and you, you see basically the same things and you can pick up that heat source really quickly. If you were to switch from a thermal uh, handheld image and you find the animal, then to a night digital night vision device, you will struggle to see or find the animal just because the heat isn't there. You see basically what we see with your, our eyes, but into colors, like I said. So camouflaged animals uh, will be really, really hard to identify within grass or bushes. Whereas with thermal, that they can't hide and therefore you can find them a lot quicker and take the shot. Is it better? Well, if you can afford a thermal scope and thermal scope prices have come down to the same level now as digital night vision devices, for the vast majority of hunters, it is a better choice over digital night vision. In some contractual obligations, digital night vision is the way to go. Field of view and field of view comparison. Field of view is imperative when choosing the right handheld device. That might be a monocular or binoculars. The field of view that you choose needs to be based on the terrain that you're hunting in. If you're hunting in a forest or in scrub or in the bush, you need a wide field of view or the widest field of view. If you are on open plains, you can go with a narrow field of view, which gives you therefore higher magnification or a higher base magnification. It's always a trade-off. Higher base magnification means smaller field of view. Wider field of view means lower base magnification and therefore less detection range. It's always a trade-off. So you have to choose the right field of view for your terrain. Most hunters will hunt in forests or bushland as well as open lands or from one hill to another because sometimes they hunt dogs where they need to have the detection range or the larger detection range and the bigger magnification. And sometimes they hunt pigs or deer in scrub and forests. 
So to have the best of both worlds, you have to increase the resolution. As pretty much 99% of all thermals only have digital zoom available in the devices, it all depends on how big or small your resolution of the sensor is. If you have a 385 sensor, you pretty much have to choose either or, wide field of view or narrow field of view. If you have the funds to pay for a 640, you can have the best of both worlds. You can have a wide field of view while still having the detection range and the distance that you would have with a 385 with a, with a narrow field of view or increased base magnification. So just like a firearm, you can't have everything in one on the budget end. Once you go higher and you have more funds, you can eliminate some of the trade-offs. Assuming you hunt in a forest or in bushland or bushes or scrub, you want the wide field of view because you have objects relatively close to you. And that might be five meters, 10 meters, 50 meters. The wide field of view will enable you to scan quickly through that area identifying any heat sources and then being able to approach. Now, if you were to have a narrow field of view, it would take you a lot longer. And by that, I mean, it will feel like having a spotting scope with a 20 times magnification in the forest. It'll do your head in. If you're in this kind of environment, buy a thermal with a wide field of view. A wide field of view has a base magnification of anywhere between sub one to about one and a half, two would be a trade-off. So you wanna keep it anywhere between that, up to the one and a half. A narrow field of view would be two and a half and above, two and a half to four, maybe even five. There are very few monoculars, if any. Nope, there's one that has a 5.5 base magnification, which in our opinion is too much for pretty much anybody. In the middle, at the ranges of two, two and a half, or one and a half to two and a half, that's most of the time the trade-off area. That is where 385 sensors have their sweet spot because they're not completely wide field and they're not too high. And so people that don't have the budget and they hunt in forest as well as open land, they will end up anywhere between one and a half and two and a half. And I would suggest that you base that based on where you hunt more often. So if you only hunt twice or three times a year in the forest, but you hunt 10, 15, 20 times on open land, then I would go towards the two and a half. Whereas the other way around, I would try to get closer to the one and a half. Also, for those who are trying to hunt or wanting to hunt from a vehicle, you want to have a wide field of view. So sub one and a half if possible, because it will make the difference between being able to drive and scan at the same time versus having to stop because the image is so wobbly that you can't identify anything. What it does is it increases significantly the area you can scan in the same period of time versus having to drive and stop, drive and stop, accelerate, stop, accelerate, stop. It will also reduce the overall noise pollution in the area and hopefully lead to you finding more animals. For those people who do hunt in open plain areas, you'll be looking at a base magnification of two and a half to maybe three and a half. I don't really recommend to go beyond that with only very few exceptions. Most of the time you will find yourself still walking potentially along a forest line and you do want to occasionally look into the forest or you might set off a forest 100 meters or 150 meters, and then you find that the narrow field of view might be restricting or it still take you too long to scan an area. This is particularly true for dog or fox hunters that do find that dogs and foxes tend to be further away from them, but because it takes them so long to scan around and because they might come from pretty much almost any direction relatively quickly, you want to ensure that you can scan the area and find something and then potentially with your scope identify that particular target. Now when it comes to scopes it's a little bit different. With scopes you want to focus on what type of animal you want to identify at what sort of distance. So if you were to hunt dogs and foxes and you know that you need to identify them at 200 maybe 300 meters out, you want to use the highest base magnification you can find, generally up to about four or five. If you were to hunt 
pigs, close range mobs of pigs with multiple follow-up shots, you want to use a wide field of view. So the base magnification will be anywhere between one and a half to about two and a half. This holds also true for little critters where you get relatively close. Unless you're shooting at animals where you know you're gonna take one or maybe two shots only at the same animal. Whereas if you are predicting you wanna shoot multiple animals and they might be on the run, you wanna have enough field of view that you can tell that there might be cattle soon coming up or a house or something that you don't wanna shoot at. And also you wanna have the ability to give enough lead in front of the running animal that you can take the shot. Therefore, choose the right base magnification and therefore field of view based on the animal you want to identify at a given distance. All right, let's talk about laser rangefinders and why do I need one? When using a thermal device and looking at the display, it's only two dimensional, so it is impossible to judge depth of field or the distance of an object that you're looking at. Thermal devices are magnified, so the image is not one to one. So in reality, an animal may look this big in the display, but in real life, he's only this big. So you think he's 50 meters away when in real fact, he's 200 meters away. So this makes it very hard to work out how far you can actually walk into an animal when stalking, trying to determine shot placement at a given distance and you don't know what that distance is accurately is going to be a problem. So we highly recommend having an LRF, an infrared laser rangefinder, integrated into your monocular. Now you need to make that decision before purchasing the monocular because you can't attach that at a later stage. So if you already have a thermal monocular, without an LRF, we do highly recommend getting a thermal scope and you include the LRF on this device. But in saying that, it is a much cheaper alternative than having your LRF integrated into your thermal monocular because one reason is the device doesn't have to be recoil rated. And the other reason is that a monocular is used a lot more than a scope. You'll be scanning and you'll be lasering the landscape in order to get an understanding of how far certain objects are, which enables you to know if you're in shooting range, let's say, to a forest line. If you have the laser rangefinder on your scope, it enables you to just laser the target before you take the shot. Otherwise, you would have to bring up the scope all the time and start to laser. When lasering at objects over 200 meters, you have to hold the laser or the, the, the thermal scope very, very still. Don't assume you can just bring up a thermal scope with a laser rangefinder without a rest and laser an object at 400 or 600 meters and get a reading back. The moment you basically move around, as you would anyway, uh, the laser goes out and gets reflected back. But in the moment you reflect it back, you're already off with the receiver. So therefore you're not gonna receive a reading. Whereas if you have a handheld device, it is much easier to hold that steady and get that long distance reading. There's one great advantage with something like this Konotec Polaris thermal scope. The laser is integrated into the inner works of the device, meaning that when you laser something, it can indicate what your holdover is uh, on the reticle if you have zeroed in your rifle at various different distances. In other words, if I choose to sight this scope in at 100, 200 and 300 meters, whenever I laser something within that range, it will indicate on my reticle exactly where I should be holding over. That will significantly improve your shot placement and give you more peace of mind just before you pull the trigger. Please note, very few scopes provide that sort of algorithm or feature in their scope, even though they may have an integrated laser range finder. So please ask us about it and we'll happy to help. So in summary, we recommend having an LRF in your handheld monocular because you're gonna use this nine times out of 10 in comparison to taking a shot with a thermal scope with an integrated laser range finder. Laser range finder indicates there is a laser. Yes, it is an infrared laser that you and animals can't see. However, if you were to use a night vision or a digital night vision device, you could actually see the laser and where it pulses and, and where it hits the target. Now we've done tests in the past to see how large the laser grows over distance. So as you, let's say, laser target at 100 meters, the laser might be 
20 or 30 centimeters or more. Now, some are horizontal and they expand horizontal into a line and some expand into a vertical line. It's important to realize the difference. If I were to try to laser, let's say, a fox at 200 meters on an increasing hill, I would laser and let's say, probably the laser is about a meter 50 by then. And if I laser that fox, some of that laser will hit before the ground before the fox and after the fox. And what happens is I get an echo back from two different distances. When that happens, the laser rangefinder will not indicate a distance. It will just go black and just not give you a reading at all. When it's a vertical read, you want to bring a vertical read onto like a tree stump or a tree because no matter where you laser that tree, it's in line and therefore gives you one reading back and therefore an actual reading within the device. Now, when you have a horizontal reading, then it's much easier to read something that is on an increasing hill. But if you were to try to hit a tree stump, you'll shoot left and right past the tree and then get a reflection of whatever is behind the tree. The only exception is if the tree is on top of uh, a hill and you shoot into the sky, you would only get one reading back and not multiple readings. From our experience, the Chronotech range will have a horizontal read, whereas the Infiray lasers have a vertical read. So that's just something to keep in mind because some of our customers expect to be able to laser a fox at 400 meters and then they don't get a reading back of that tiny object as being the fox. And that's just because the laser at that distance is two or three meters big and therefore lasers uh, a larger area. Keep that in mind. Try always to laser bigger objects. And if you have or your mate has a night vision device, just trial it out yourself. Take it out, take it out together, turn on the laser, add an object like a wall and then see what the laser does. Once you know, it improves your lasering and your measuring uh, out in the field and you will get more positive results back. Some thermoscopes have what's called a stadiometric rangefinder. Now, what is it and how does it work? Basically, they use telemetry to calculate a distance to a animal or target of defined size. They have two bars, a top and a bottom bar in the screen. And based on what animal you're looking at, you're moving the top bar or the bottom bar up or the top bar down in order to hit the top of the animal and the bottom of the animal. It assumes that that animal is of a certain or defined size. For some, it means that a boar is 70 centimeters tall or a deer might be one meter 50. If that animal is of that size and you put those two bars on the bottom and on the top of the animal, you will then be displayed a distance and that distance will be accurate. However, because you're using a thermal, you can't tell if the animal is necessarily a small boar or a big boar or a fallow deer or a rusa deer, which is significantly taller most of the time, or a young deer or an older deer. Obviously, if you have antlers there, you can go a bit about that, but it is effectively in the field, absolutely useless and will be off significantly. For example, if you have a pig that's only 50 centimeters tall or even 40 centimeters tall, and you're looking at a 70 centimeter defined size, you'll be off by what, 30, 40%. So instead of 100 meters, it's 150 meters. Or instead of 200 meters, it might be 280 or 300 meters. So it can be significantly off and therefore pretty much is useless and is not advised to be used. We believe it's a gimmick from the manufacturer and a great idea from uh, engineers that don't have field experience. Be aware, it is absolutely not a replacement of a proper laser rangefinder. What are the basic parts of a thermal imaging device? Well, we start with a rare earth metal germanium lens which goes through to a thermal imaging sensor, which is connected to a CPU. And within that, the algorithms take that radiation information that the sensor picks up and then translates that to what we can see as an image on a display. Thermal images also have varying power supplies. They can be an internal lithium battery, they could be removable batteries, or a lot of devices will accept an external power supply. Important to note is that the resolution on the display 
is based on the resolution of the sensor. So if the sensor can record 640 pixels, then that resolution is projected on the display. However, today the displays actually have a HD resolution. So the 640 pixels from the sensor is basically blown up on the HD display. In other words, the resolution of the display is irrelevant. What matters is the resolution of the sensor. So don't get fooled by some of the marketing guys saying, oh, it has a HD display or it has a 4K display. It doesn't matter because the image is still generated and processed by the sensor and therefore the sensor is the limiting unit in your thermal device. All right, let's talk about what type of thermals are out there. Thermals split into handheld devices, into scopes, clip-ons, car mounted or helmet mounted thermals. So thermal handheld devices are categorized in monocular and binoculars. So here I have a monocular, which is used by one eye. One disadvantage of a monocular is looking at a bright display. At night time, you will not blind that eye. Here I have a set of binoculars, which still only have one objective lens, and the image is displayed through two identical displays for both eyes. And still you're unable to judge distance at night time when looking through a digital binocular device. So some customers do struggle just looking through a monocular at night because you get night blinded in one eye. We suggest then using binoculars, but then you can be night blinded in both eyes, which can be an issue and restrict your movement around at night time, as opposed to still using monocular and being able to use one eye to move around at night time. Thermal monoculars are more common and cost effective as opposed to thermal binoculars, because there are only a few manufacturers that make binoculars to start with, and the cost is much higher because there are so many parts that need to be duplicated in a binocular. Thermal scopes come in different designs. There is the rifle scope looking design, which uses rings, traditional scope rings to mount to your forearm, or the traditional rail mounted design, where a mount that sits onto a Riva or Picatinny rail basically gets attached on the bottom and then attached to your forearm. Note that some thermals come with a laser range finding unit, so this unit that you can see up top here, um, whereas this version is exactly the same but doesn't come with a laser range finder. Some units can have laser range finders later on attached to them, but other units such as this unit uh, cannot. All right, let's talk about thermal Clip-ons. Thermal clip-ons are thermal devices that attach to the front of your scope. We have two devices here, one from Infiray and one from Pulsar. Now, these devices can only attach to a day scope such as this one by using an adapter. These adapters have to be bought for each individual scope you have. So unless you have the same exact scope, you can use the same adapter. That said, there are some adapters which work on various different size objective lenses of your day scope. However, these are very likely to lose zero over time and are also not as accurate as dedicated adapters for specific sizes. How does it work? You just screw the adapter onto the end of your thermal device and then attach the adapter to your day scope. You line up your thermal that it is horizontally aligned and then you use, in this case, a lever to tighten it up. When you look through your day scope, you'll be able to see the image projected by the thermal into the objective lens of your day scope, therefore turning your day scope into a thermal device. We also have head mounted thermal devices, which through an NVG mount, can connect to headgear or a tactical style helmet and be brought down over your eyes and sometimes even used too. The advantage of head mounted thermals is that you have your hands free and most of the time they have a base magnification of one which is exactly like your eyes. So you are able to walk around at night with those devices therefore covering more land in less time. 
Now let's look at vehicle mounted thermals. So here we have a PTZ dome camera from Infrared, and this can be mounted on permanently or using suction cups temporarily to the top or part of a moving vehicle and used primarily as a scanning thermal. Vehicle mounted thermals use Wi-Fi or cables to project the image that they capture onto a display in your car. Through either the tablet or a dedicated joystick, you'll be able to control the unit, spin it around, have it scan, or even in some cases, these units have optical lasers that you can see and therefore know which direction the thermal is looking. Some actually have laser range finders built in as well, which then will give you the distance to whatever animal or target or object you decide to laser. There are two different types of vehicle mounted thermals, one that is stabilized and ones that aren't stabilized. The stabilized image while the vehicle is moving around rough terrain, you can still scan and see a nice still clear image on the display. Whereas a non-stabilized device, you would normally have to stop and scan the actual area and not be doing that while you're traveling. So in essence, a stabilized device is gonna save you time and effectively money if you're a contractor as you recover much more land over the same period of time. Now let's talk about thermal device specifications. One of the most important specifications in a thermal device is how many pixels does the sensor of the device have. Thermal devices split into HD, so 1080, into 640 and into 384. When we refer to these numbers, we're referring to the amount of pixels on the horizontal on the sensor, meaning that a 384 has 384 pixels on the horizontal and 288 on the vertical. The 640 has 640 pixels on the horizontal and 512 most of the time, sometimes 480 pixels on the vertical axis. The 640 chip has just over 300,000 pixels on the entire chip, whereas the 384 has around 110,000 pixels. So why is it important to choose the right thermal device with the right amount of pixels? If you use a 384 pixel sensor, every time, or with any thermal, every time you double your zoom, so you go from one to two, from two to four, from four to eight, for example, you are halving the pixels that you see. So when you start with 380, you go down to 190, and then you zoom again, you're going down to about 95. That means that you just only have 95 pixels on the horizontal and probably around the 80 or 70 on the vertical. That will bring up an image that is very, very pixelated or you will perceive it as very pixelated. For some brands, they blur the image out so you don't notice the pixel pixelation as much and therefore you always think it's a blurry image and you try to play with your focus and it's not gonna get better but that's based on the specific algorithms of specific brands. Now, coming back to the pixels, what that means is that with a 384 unit, you can only double your zoom twice and still maintain a usable image. Also keep in mind that every time you zoom in, you are still zooming in onto the exact same image. The sensor will not provide any more information. It is just a digital zoom onto the same image, degrading the image that you're seeing. When you have a 640 sensor, you can zoom in three times, as in double the zoom three times, so two, four, eight, and you can still use that image as it is the same or almost the same as if you were to zoom in twice with a 384 pixel unit. Some manufacturers are releasing now HD units, so 1080. Now with that, or 1080 pixels, with that you can zoom in one more time. So you can zoom in four times and still have a usable image, which just gives you a lot more detection range or identification range, meaning you can see and identify animals from further away. Why does that matter? Well, if I can determine an animal or target from 100 meters away or from 300 meters away, I just saved myself 200 meters in walking. All this does is it saves time walking while scanning or driving around. 
which means that you can cover more land in the same period of time. And with covering more land, it generally equates to more opportunities to find animals. What is pixel pitch? Also referred to 12 or 17 micron. Well, it is the physical distance between the center of the pixel on the chip to the next pixel, meaning that you have 12 or 17 micron between each pixel. That's pretty much irrelevant to anything out in the field. But what it does, it decreases the size of the overall sensor. If you had 17 microns between each individual pixel and you have 640 pixels on a chip, as you reduce it to 12, you reduce the size of the sensor by over 30%. Now that leads the manufacturer to have the ability to also decrease the objective lens equally in order to still provide enough radiation onto the sensor. Now, why is that important? As you decrease the germanium lens, you significantly decrease the price of the device. The lens is the most expensive single piece of a thermal device. It is a rare earth metal and therefore extremely pricey. If a manufacturer can reduce the size of the lens and keep the same quality of image, then therefore the device is going to be cheaper. The other benefit of having a smaller sensor and therefore a smaller objective lens is that the weight of the thermal device is being reduced and for people that have used thermals before, especially the older thermals, they're quite heavy and so a reduction in weight can't hurt. So the benefit of a reduced pixel pitch is that the thermal is cheaper while having the same specifications as well as lighter. However, it does not mean that the pixels are actually smaller on the display or on the image that you see. It is very misleading and unfortunately a lot of people get that wrong. Okay, now let's talk about net D. What is NetD? Noise equivalent temperature difference. And that relates to the sensitivity of the thermal sensor itself. And this is measured in millikelvins, 50, 40, and the lowest on the market today is 25. So in reality, what does this mean when you're out in the field? Well, if you're lucky like us in the Sunshine State, that doesn't mean a whole lot. But if you're in Southern states of Australia and you get caught out in bad weather a lot, then NetD would affect your thermal device. So the lower the millikelvin rating is going to increase the sensitivity of the thermal sensor. Which means it can look through rain and fog more easily, giving you greater detection range through bad weather. So if you are in a bad weather area or hunt often in bad weather, look out for the lowest number that you can afford. Each thermal device, monocular, binocular, clip-on or thermal scope, all have a base magnification just like your day scope. Base magnification in combination with the lens diameter will determine the field of view. The field of view is absolutely important how you're choosing the right thermal device. May that be a monocular binocular with a extreme wide field of view or narrow field of view or scopes and clip-ons, which need to provide enough magnification to provide you with enough information about what animal you are looking at or what object you are looking at. Now the base magnification is extremely important, especially for handheld devices such as monoculars and binoculars. It is imperative that you choose the right base magnification for your terrain that you hunt in if you're talking about a handheld device or if you're talking about a scope or scope attachment, you want to ensure that the base magnification is high enough to provide you with enough magnification at those ranges that you are most likely to take the shot at. Because you want to make sure that you can identify the animal before you pull the trigger. You should always identify the animal before you pull the trigger. Alright, let's look at the difference between mechanical zoom and digital zoom. Mechanical zoom up until very recently has not been available in any sort of thermal device. The advantage of a mechanical zoom, similar to your day scope over a digital zoom, is you don't lose any clarity of image and you can zoom in on an object without losing any resolution. Meaning that a 640 chip at two times magnification may still be a 640 image at three or four times magnification. This is really highly dependent on the lenses and the mechanics within the device. 
Thermals with mechanical zoom have also the ability to digital zoom, meaning that once you exceed or use all of your mechanical zoom, you can then start to digitally zoom, which allows manufacturers to provide thermal handheld devices with an extreme wide field of view and then still enable you to zoom in mechanically and then further digitally enabling you to achieve extreme long detection and identification ranges. Digital zoom, on the other hand, is pretty much what 99% of all thermal scopes to date have, which means it is a fixed zoom or a fixed magnification. And as you zoom in, you zoom in onto the image that is provided by the sensor. For example, have a 640 sensor, 640 pixels. As you zoom in, every time you zoom in, you potentially have the amount of pixels that you see to the point where it becomes extremely pixelated and not usable. Now let's talk about the difference between detection range, recognition range and identification range. Detection range is defined as the distance where a human sized heat source, so that is 180 by 50 centimeters wide, can still light up four pixels on a thermal device. This is a very theoretical number because in reality happens is if you look into uh, a landscape, there are multiple heat sources, no matter what you're looking at. So seeing four pixels out of potentially 100 or 300,000 pixels on your display is pretty much impossible for the human eye to actually notice. So it is a theoretical number. However, because it is standardized and determined across all thermal devices these days, it gives you the ability to compare thermal devices across each other. Meaning that if you have a thermal device which has a 1,300 meter detection range and another one that has 2,600 meters detection range, you can assume that you can identify animals from twice as far away than you can with the 1300 meter device. Don't use the actual value for anything meaningful. Use the value to compare devices across each other. Recognition range is the range where you can start to recognize what an object might be. For example, detection range is just a blurb, just something, let's say square, and you have no idea what the heat source is. Recognition range would be that you'll be able to tell it's a car or it's a four-legged animal, but you don't know more than that. Identification range is the range where you clearly can identify what an object is. For example, a four-legged animal is now a deer or cattle or pigs or a dog or a fox. Whereas the car, you can tell it's an SUV, four-wheel drive or just something else or yeah. So then. So then. Identification range is the range where you will be able to identify the animal and be able to take a shot. Please note that from detection range to identification range, there's a huge gap. Where the detection range might be two kilometers, the identification range of a fox might be 200 meters. So don't expect at a two kilometer detection range to be able to tell a fox from a dog at 500 meters. It's not gonna happen. Very few thermal manufacturers will actually provide identification ranges. Some do, so have a look at them. The other thing about identification ranges is that they are very subjective, meaning that the more experience you have behind a thermal device and the more time you have to actually look at the animal and see the animal behave in the environment, the further away you'll be able to tell what it is. Therefore, as you become more experienced, the identification range for you personally will increase. Okay, let's talk about different thermal power supplies and battery types. Typically, monoculars will come with an internal lithium battery, which has to be recharged for each use, but can also use an external power supply through a USB connection. Thermal scopes, like this one here, use off-the-shelf 18650 batteries, which are cost-effective, and having a few sets will get you hunting through the night. Here we have a thermal binoculars with a proprietary removable rechargeable battery, but being proprietary, these can be very costly. Now this thermal scope has both an internal rechargeable battery and a proprietary removable battery which can be charged and additional batteries purchased but again can be costly as they are proprietary. Let's talk about connectivity. 
Under connectivity, we understand either a Wi-Fi connection or a cabled connection. And these connections go from the device itself to uh, a tablet, a monitor, or a screen. These days, most devices, not all, but most devices are able to create a Wi-Fi network to which your tablet or monitor connects. You are able then to stream the live footage from the device to your tablet, iPhone, iPad, whatever you choose. Normally, this happens via the manufacturer's app. So all manufacturers, or at least most of them, or the ones that offer thermals with Wi-Fi connectivity, also offer a free downloadable app that you can download from the App Store or via a QR code in the manual. Once downloaded, you connect it to the Wi-Fi of the device and then you have a live stream connection. Important to note is that some manufacturers are better than others in the development of the apps and the capability of these apps, as well as the connectivity between the Wi-Fi and how stable it is. So some manufacturers have struggled to maintain a secure or constant Wi-Fi connection between the device and the tablets. Meaning that when you have your thermal, let's say, on the car roof and you connect it to a tablet behind your steering wheel or on the dashboard and you're driving, it is common for some devices to drop out, meaning you get a stuttering or you lose completely connectivity and then you have to connect again. That's very painful when you're out in the field. So it's one of those things, make sure you give us a call and we can talk you through which brands have more problems with others. At the time of the recording, it used to be that Pulsar struggled with that. However, they have brought out Stream Vision 2, which from our experience has been a lot more stable. So we consider that problem resolved for devices that use the Stream 2. The alternative option to Wi-Fi often is that you can connect a AV cable from the device to an AV display, such as your reversing camera display. So just be mindful, some devices have that capability and supply those cables, other devices don't. So if you in the need of, again, it's one of those things that you should be checking in the user manual or in the product description. Another feature of thermal devices is the internal storage. Most devices these days have the capability of video recording and audio. However, it is still not standard across the devices. For those devices who do have audio recording and video recording, they will have internal storage capacity. In our opinion, it doesn't really matter if that's 64 gigabytes, 16 gigabytes or whatever it is. The internal storage is at the right size for the particular thermal. Meaning, if you have a thermal with a higher resolution sensor, therefore the internal storage will be sufficient for you to record hours and hours and hours of footage before you actually have to start deleting or moving the files from the device to a computer. All devices that do have internal storage capacity have the ability to transfer it via a cable to a computer. Those who do have Wi-Fi connectivity also have the ability to transfer the files to your tablet via the app. Some devices do say they record audio. Some devices do that better than others. For example, the Pulsar range do a very, very good job recording audio, whereas the Infiray devices still struggle. Some, like the new Zoom, have very, very good audio recording and the Finder series has just been upgraded with audio, which unfortunately at this point we haven't tested yet, so I can't comment on that. The Rico range, for example, the audio basically only records the shots fired and doesn't have the capability to record the sound when you chatter before you take the shot or when you talk to your mate. So we're hoping that Infure will continue to upgrade their audio capability. Please check the product descriptions and do check in with us because like I said, sometimes they do say they have audio, but it's not really usable audio. In terms of video recording, the video recording can only be of the quality of the sensor itself. So if you have a 640 pixel sensor, it'll be better than a 385. That said, some companies record the entire image that you see when you look through the thermal device. Pulsar does record the menu settings, the entire display information, the reticle, the whole lot. Some other manufacturers and even some other devices, they sometimes record 
nothing at all, not even the radical, and some record the radical and not the display information. So if you were to try to show your mate on a video, for example, how you change settings, which doesn't really affect the recreational hunter so much, but more us, uh, it becomes really difficult because all that information isn't recorded and therefore we can't share it. What is picture and picture? Well, picture and picture is when you have a smaller picture in your main picture, which you can see here. Now the smaller picture is a zoomed in version of the center of your radical. Though sometimes that zoomed in radical looks a bit different, it is the center of your radical, wherever your radical is on your screen and wherever you sighted it in. This will enable you to do the first precision shot based on the information in the picture and picture, which is zoomed in. And then you just look down and you can use the full big image to then do any follow-up shots. This is particularly handy for pig hunting. It is a very personal choice. Some people love it and can't do without, and others don't really care and never use it. But for the people who start loving it, they will not buy a thermal that doesn't allow for picture-in-picture -picture functionality. So is it valuable? For some people it is, absolutely. For some people it isn't. It really is based on your personal preference if you like to have that option. It doesn't hurt to have the feature, and if you know that you want it, ensure that the thermal that you're buying has it. Do any thermals have shot or recoil activated video options? Yes, in Australia, the ATN thermal range does have recoil activated video options. What is that? Basically, the device will constantly record and delete the footage. Once you shoot and the recoil hits the thermal device, the thermal device registered the recoil and will save the last 30 seconds before, or whatever you say, the last minute or two minutes before you took the shot. This is really handy because you don't have to remember to push the record button every time you take a shot. And sometimes in the heat of the moment, you don't even think about it and you take the shot and then you think, oh man, I wish I would have pushed that record button. The downside of that is that it will chew up heaps of battery power because it's constantly recording and constantly deleting all that footage, you chew through battery relatively quickly. So again, it's a trade-off between battery power and having the ability to do so. But as far as we're concerned, at this very moment, only ATN provides that feature. Let's talk about brands. Brands don't necessarily equal manufacturers. One manufacturer can produce multiple brands. It is important to understand that there are only a handful of companies in the world that make thermal sensors. Some of those are Pulsar, Infiray, Dali, Hick Vision or Hick Micro, and I believe Guide. All other brands are made by companies that purchase those sensors from those companies or these thermal sensor manufacturers actually make them for particular brands. So, this is also called OEM manufacturing. Burris, Leica, Nitec, iAiming, Konotec, Steiner. All these thermals that you can get from these brands aren't made by the brand. They are made by those few manufacturers, or at least they are providing these chips. So when you're looking at brands like a Leica, that is still made by one of the companies that make the sensors, which means that you potentially are paying a lot more just because of the brand name on the device. The quality is still the same or similar to the other brands that the manufacturer might actually own themselves. So what I'm trying to say is when you're looking at brands, look at the specifications of the thermal. That will indicate the value for money that you're gonna get. If the device is a lot more expensive because it might have a premium brand attached to it, but the specifications are of other brands that are two, three thousand dollars cheaper, you're paying for the brand name on the device not necessarily for the specifications or the quality that you are getting. Another point is that the companies that buy the sensors can pretty much never be at the forefront of innovation. 
because they always have to wait until these manufacturers bring out the next sensors. Versus the actual manufacturers, they have obviously access to their R&D and therefore know what's coming and when it's coming and can already design new products. So they tend to be at the forefront when it comes to innovation. Let's talk about pricing. What should you spend your money on? It highly depends on your situation from a budgetary perspective as well as your hunting situation and your needs. We recommend to spend as much money as necessary and available on a monocular or handheld device to have the right device for your environment and your needs. That is the most important device and that should always be the first device you buy. After you have a handheld device, then you can go and buy a thermal device. For most customers, it means two purchases at two different points in time. Meaning that I'll buy the monocular now, and then later on in a year's time or so, once I saved up some more money, I buy the thermal scope. To bridge that period of time, we recommend to either use your day scope with a red light torch, or if you do have a little bit money left over, then you might consider digital night vision. That said, thermal scopes have come down in price by so far. Sometimes the entry level thermal scopes are cheaper than the higher end digital night vision scopes. So in the end, you decide what your budget is and we can help you with finding the right handheld device and obviously thermal scope to suit that budget. In terms of pricing, Thermal monoculars now start at around 800, 900 Australian dollars and go up to 10, thousand dollars roughly. Uh, scopes start around the two thousand dollar mark or just shy of two thousand dollars and also go up to the ten thousand dollars or beyond. Do the budgets monoculars and scopes suffice? Yes, a monocular that now cost nine hundred dollars uh, would have cost about three thousand dollars five years ago. So when we first got into thermals and we, we had those bottom entry level thermals that would cost three grand, it significantly improved our our hunting experience as well as our take home and therefore I can only recommend if you do have the budget get into it even on the budget end because it still will significantly improve your success. But I like to point out at this point that just because you double the expense you will not get twice the success. It basically is deteriorating as you increase your budget. So the first $2,000, $4,000 will bring you a lot more success than the additional two or $4,000. So keep that in mind. Types of thermal hunting styles. You can either hunt from a vehicle, on foot, stalking, or from a blind, just like during the day. The difference really is that you wanna position yourself in vantage points where you can use the technology to its advantage. So thermal works really well by quickly detecting animals and then moving in. That might be moving in via a car and scanning or walking in. At night, you have the ability to use different vantage points that you otherwise wouldn't use during the day, as in, you can be in the middle of the field standing and scanning and animals, as long as you're not moving around or turning a light on, animals will completely ignore you. Whereas during the day, you would never stand in the middle of the field and have a look around with the binoculars. Another example is when I use thermals during the day, I would hunt here in Australia southern facing flanks because the southern facing flanks generally don't have direct sunlight on them, which means I don't get a lot of false positives. And it's easy for me to scan the area and find animals between the trees. At what distances do I hunt what type of animals? Dogs and foxes are very skittish. They tend to move really quickly through the countryside. So I tend to have a wide field of view handheld device to quickly identify them so I can have a few more seconds left to take the shot. Also, these animals are generally shot during the day anywhere between pretty much 20 meters up to two, 300 meters. Foxes at night can be easily called in to very close distances. However, sometimes you have to take a shot at 100 or 150, maybe 
maybe 250 meters. Same for dogs. To enable you to do that, you have to have a thermal scope with a high enough base magnification to give you enough confidence that that is a dog or a fox at a certain range. Also very important is that you have a laser rangefinder either on your handheld device or on your rifle scope because at those distances it is extremely difficult to judge what exact distance it may be and therefore your shot placement can potentially be off resulting in a miss or even worse in a wounded animal. When it comes to pigs, you can get extremely close to pigs. Pigs don't have good hearing or good eyesight at night and are extremely loud when feeding. However, they continue to have an extreme good sense of smell. So there's no way you're gonna get really close to pigs if you upwind. Always approach any animal if possible from downwind or be ready to take longer distance shots. When you get really close to pigs, remember that pigs have their head very close to the ground, which means they are looking up to you. As you get to about 50 meters or closer on a flat, they potentially can silhouette your body against the night sky. So keep that in mind. As you get closer, you want to get down or you want to ensure the pigs are high up and you're walking up a hill, then you can get really, really close. Polar opposite, if they are in a valley and you're coming over a hilltop, you're going to have a hard time approaching them to very close distances. Always consider that you want to have enough field of view in your scope for follow-up shots, especially when you are approaching animals that are like pigs in a mob, potentially with multiple targets. When it comes to deer, deer have very good sense of smell, very good hearing, and they can see very well at night compared to pigs. So with deer, you probably want to stay about 50 meters or more away from them in order to not spook them and take the shot. Where can I hunt at night? This is highly dependent on the legislation in your particular state or territory. So unfortunately, I can't comment on that. I just give you a couple examples. In Queensland, you can hunt on private property at night without a problem with any device. In New South Wales, you used to not be able to hunt deer with night vision or thermal devices because they were considered a game species, whereas now they're classified as a feral pest and therefore it's free game. That, however, only applies to private property, whereas in a state forest to this day, you're still not allowed to use thermal or night vision devices. So please check with your firearms branch or police first before you're using night or thermal devices in your hunting area. Let's talk about thermal hunting setups specifically on foot hunting and stalking. Now you'll be looking at a handheld device, like we said earlier, handheld device should be the first one you buy anyway. So handheld device, then a scope, preferably a thermal scope, then you'll be looking at a rest, as well as potentially a saddle clamp that holds your rifle. And the last piece is a headlamp. We recommend using a headlamp because it keeps your hands free so that you can have the rest in one hand, your rifle over the shoulder, and then you work with your rest and your rifle while having the headlamp. We highly, highly, highly recommend that the headlamp is a red light or green light, preferably red light. Why? because animals tend to not care about red light as much as daylight. They are now used to perceiving daylight torches or spotters as a threat or a danger and therefore will move away from it. Whereas red light is not commonly used and most animals just continue to do what they do. The next couple things about the headlamp is that it should be dimmable so that you can throw just enough light out to be able to move safely through the environment, as well as focusable, so that you can focus it to just in front of your feet. For those who don't have two, three hundred dollars for such a headlamp, a way around it is getting a daylight lamp and then going to Amazon and search for a studio light film. It is an extremely cheap way of changing the light of your torches or even spotlights. These films cost around 10 bucks Australian on Amazon. There's an image here. You can also use those films and tape them to the front of your car where your spotlights are or your high beams, which allows you to then drive around with red light, uh, you'll be able to see and, and drive throughout the countryside, but you won't potentially spook the animals as much. A couple things about safety. So moving around at night, 
can result really quickly in you getting lost. So it's imperative that you have a GPS or a GPS enabled cell phone on you. And make sure you have enough batteries because once that cell phone runs out, you're still stuffed. We also recommend always go with multiple people if you can, or at least have one buddy around. Always tell someone where you're going to be, when you're going to be back, so that that someone can find you in an emergency. Let's say a snake bite or something similar, you really want to make sure that someone close by comes out and checks on you, or you have some sort of communication devices set up that you can communicate with them in a case of an emergency. When hunting from a vehicle, you have the option of a roof-mounted thermal or a handheld thermal that is mounted on a roof or you just use it out of the car window. There are also options to have what's called a rake and rest, for example, in the window frame of your car. That will allow you to have your gun mounted in the rest and securely placed there. Uh, it allows you to pull out the gun very quickly as well as have a steady shot. If you were to have it in front of you while driving obviously for many reasons that's quite unsafe therefore a rake and rest in the window frame is highly recommended and pretty much all colors and professional shooters these days uh, use such a device or similar devices you have the ability to connect your spotlight to that or in this case your thermal device and then wi-fi that thermal image onto a screen in your car we have cases where our contract shooters have a display in front of the steering wheel for the driver, so the driver sees what's going on. The driver might even be operating the thermal. Then we have a shooter up back on the tray and they have also a screen so that everybody in the car sees the same thing and can follow the same thing and then can work together as a team. Lastly, you potentially will have a thermal scope. It's important to understand that if you have a dedicated car thermal as in it's mounted to the car uh, and only used to be on the car you can't just pick that up and walk around once you down something um, you probably will also have in addition a handheld thermal so that you can find the animal that you might have downed in an area where you can't drive your car to let's talk about budget setups if you don't have a big budget and you want to get into it, the very first thing to buy is a budget monocular. They start about eight, nine hundred dollars and they're very usable and actually they, they're pretty damn good for the money. That gets you started from a handheld device perspective. Then the next thing you're going to buy is a torch, a daylight torch. You've heard before that daylight torches aren't a good idea, but red light torches are too expensive potentially. So what you do is you buy a studio light film from Amazon for about $10. You then tape that film to the front of your torch and et voila, you have a red light torch for the price pretty much of a daylight torch. You then need connectors or adapters to connect your torch to your day scope. It is important that you buy some that are able to dial in the torch onto the reticle that you have in your day scope because you want to throw the center of the beam exactly where the reticle of your um, day scope is pointed at. That will reduce the overall amount of light that you need downrange in order to take a shot. That in turn will allow you to have more time as the animals don't get as quickly irritated by the light. As you increase the light downrange, the animals get irritated and they bugger off or they might just turn their bums towards you and then you're in for Texas hard shot. Next, you'll be looking at a headlamp. Again, just buy a cheap daylight headlamp, uh, tape the film over the headlamp, and et voila, you have a red headlamp. Sometimes you can find a red headlamp for a few bucks, 10, 20 bucks, even in some of the camping stores. Last, I would recommend cut a stick about chin high with the V-shape up top so you can rest your gun. Cost you nothing, cost you a bit of time, and you'll be up and running and you always have a rest. It also helps you to walk through difficult terrain at night because sometimes it gets a bit tricky to find the right spots to stand on, especially in, in rocky terrain. So all in all, for about a thousand bucks or a thousand one hundred bucks, you should be up and running and should be able to fully hunt at night. Top notch setup. A top-notch setup would basically be around at least $4,000 for a handheld device and $4,000 or more for a thermoscope. 
Once you have all the adapters and pieces and rests uh, and headlamps, you probably be looking just shy of 10 grand. If you really want to get into it and buy once and cry once, you'll be looking anywhere between eight and 10 grand. The top notch setup is not different from the devices to the budget setup. The only difference is that you'll have a thermal scope instead of a torch and a day scope, and the rest is just premium products with the same capability or enhanced capability, but you still need the same equipment headlamp, a rest, and then a handheld and a thermal scope. Basic equipment beyond the actual thermal or night vision device would be a rest. We find that if you hunt on foot and you normally would lean on a tree, at night everything is quiet. There are no birds, there, there's pretty much not a lot of noise, not a lot of car noise or, or other noise. So at night you have to be a lot more quiet, which means that if you want to shoot off a tree or rest on a tree, that tree has a lot of branches and a lot of leaves underneath it. So you actually really basically encourage yourself not to go there because you might be spooking the animal due to the noise that you create. You're better off carrying a tripod, bipod, monopod, even to the point where we recommend, if you can't afford it, just take a stick with a V-shape up top that you can rest your rifle on. That will significantly increase your accuracy over longer distances and allow you to silently approach an animal because you can choose the best path through the terrain uh, to get to your target or to your shooting position. Other equipment would be torches or headlamps. Because you try to be stealthy, it's quite pointless to uh, run a daylight head torch or a daylight torch to get from A to B because you are currently out of range to take the shot and you need to get 200 meters closer to your target. So in order to stay stealthy, we recommend that you're looking at red light headlamps or red light torches. It is important that these torches or headlamps are dimmable so that you can turn them down to the right level uh, that you have just enough light on the ground in front of you so you're able to walk safely through the terrain. Do suppressors increase your night hunting capability or success? Suppressors will lead to an increase in success uh, while hunting at night. One part is that the suppressors will reduce the overall sound of shooting the firearm, which will cause the animals when they scatter to run potentially into all directions and not necessarily just away from you. Therefore, you have a chance sometimes to have follow-up shots that you otherwise wouldn't have because they're running away from you and quickly get out of range. The next thing is that because the suppressor continues to hold the flames of the shot within the suppressor, you find that the animals don't see a muzzle flash and therefore also don't associate you or the area in which you're standing as a threat, hence potentially running right at you. If you don't have access to suppressors, or legally can't use them, flash hiders or muzzle brakes will also increase your chance of follow-up shots. Flash hiders basically redirect the gases as they come out into multiple directions, reducing the time of the actual flame uh, appearing in front of your barrel or your muzzle. That again will cause animals to potentially not pick up on it and run towards you. Muzzle brakes tend to, if it's an aggressive muzzle brake, throw the gases back at you. It will also throw the sound towards you, meaning away from the target, which again allows animals to potentially uh, run for you rather than away from you or sideways. Mounting a thermal in the position of your spotlight. Today, there are adapters available that fit onto a standard spotlight mount and then connect via a quick release system to a mini weaver rail. This mini weaver rail, therefore, can be mounted onto the thermal. All thermals have a one quarter inch thread on the bottom of it, or pretty much all of them other than potentially clip-ons. And you connect this rail via the screw uh, to the thermal device. Once connected, you can then just clip this thermal device into the quick release, and then bops your uncle. You can then scan with the thermal on top of your car just as you were to scan with your spotlight. One of the benefits of doing that, you can scan 360 degrees because your spotlight generally is high enough to get around your entire car. 
Whereas if you were to try to scan out of a window, you could only scan in one direction, either the right or the left. Keep in mind, thermal devices can only see the temperature of surfaces. Glass has a surface. So when you look at glass, you're not looking through glass, you're looking at glass, and therefore you see the temperature of the glass. Technically speaking, glass is a polished surface, therefore it reflects heat radiation, meaning it's basically a mirror. So when you're looking at glass that is in a 90 degree angle towards you, face towards you, you can see yourself in the glass just like a mirror. Therefore, you'll not be able to look through the front windscreen and therefore can only use the side windows once you roll them down. So your area of scanning is very much hindered. So you do want to put it up there if you have the ability. Mounting options for your thermal. There are various different mounting options. However, they strongly depend on the design of your thermal. Traditionally designed thermals such as this Konotec Polaris do have connection threads on the bottom that connect to a mounting rail. The mounting rail gets connected to the thermal. The mounts then connect to your Weaver or Picatinny rail. It is important to know that they need to be full length because these grips here and here generally don't line up with your bases that you might have on top of your action if you don't have a full length rail, which my personal German build steel action does not have the capability. I cannot mount this particular thermal on my rifle, so be mindful of that. The next thing you can consider then is a thermal that is designed as a scope or in the shape of a scope. So this Thermion here, which is a Pulsar Thermion XP50, can be mounted just like any scope with a 30mm diameter. You can use normal rings you use for the scope to mount this thermal. Just ensure that you have enough room free under your objective because these objective lenses are quite big. You need to ensure that your rings are high enough. You could also choose to use a quick release rail like this one from American Defense Manufacturing, which will return back to zero. This would allow you to quickly swap between thermal and day scope and vice versa. When I go out myself, I tend to sit about two to three hours before sundown at a vantage point. And uh, as the sun goes down, at some point I switch from my day scope to my thermal scope. I do that by using something similar to this or for example, the Polaris that comes with a quick release rail if you can mount it to your rifle. And then as the night progresses, I continue with my thermal scope. Then in the morning, I'll just swap it around again and then hunt throughout the day with my day scope. When it comes to clip-ons, clip-ons are connected or mounted to the day scope via an adapter. Thermal clip-ons do not come with adapters. You always will need to buy an adapter separately. The adapter has to not only suit your thermal device, it also needs to suit your rifle scope. Currently in the market, there are several different adapters. However, we can only recommend at this point one company and that's Rusan. The Rusan adapters are very accurate and retain zero, even over time. And the reason for that is that the Rusan adapters do not have an inlet. Some adapters, like the Pulsar adapter, do come with multiple inlays, which allows you to switch one adapter to multiple different scopes at, with different diameters. For you, it means that these rubber inlets will eventually over time give and will cause that for you to lose zero. So you'll have to check zero uh, more often, more frequently. Also what it does is that because you're squishing on rubber, you will not have the same accuracy or the same grouping that you would have with a Rusan adapter. The Rusan adapters are made for a particular diameter. They are made to 0.2 millimeters. So if your scope is 50 mil, you have to get a 50 mil Rusan adapter. If your scope is 50.3 millimeters, then the 50 mil will not fit you will have to have an adapter for each scope that has a different diameter. That does come at an increased cost, otherwise you'll be trading accuracy. So it's always a trade-off. You need to choose what's right for you and if your budget allows for it. Mate, I really hope this information helps you when you get out there and hunt at night. 
And if you're in the market for some equipment, please give us a call. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video and happy hunting.